I hope you can see it now. Okay. Yes, sir, it is okay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, in the last uh, class, we have been uh, looking at uh, the biodiversity that is going to be affected by climate change. And uh, we are going to continue with that. I think uh, this is the last slide I was uh, going to project to you, but I uh, didn't get the time to explain. So now we start with this particular slide and uh, uh, we will uh, explain it uh, or about it. You cannot see my video. Or, uh, it okay. Okay, can you see the slide now, Subhash? Yes. Okay, you can see that. All right. Okay. Uh, now, the increased uh, vulnerability of biodiversity and ecosystem due to global climate change. This is uh, the prediction that was made by IPCC in 2007. So look at it carefully. And uh, because we are going to see after uh, seven years what happened to this one, these predictions. Now, according to them, increased the global temperature that is uh, at uh, 20 to 30 percent loss in biodiversity that was predicted. This was all. These are all predictions, you know, which are they are really not happening. You know. Associated disturbance such as floods, drought, etc. Resilience of many ecosystems will be exceeded. Changes in ecosystem structure and function. So these are these were the predictions made. So we know that uh, uh, ecosystem can change with uh, such uh, disturbances such as floods, droughts, etc. We have seen in Kerala itself that uh, we after the two floods that is in 2018 and 2019, there are a lot of changes in the ecosystem. In the mountain ecosystem, in the Western Guards, you can see a lot of uh, landslides have happened and which has changed the whole face of the Western Guards in many places. And in the coastal side, you can see that many rivers have got flooded and they have taken away the land in many areas. And at the sea level, sea coast, you can see that Sea erosion was very serious at many places. A lot of land was actually lost. So there is a change in the ecosystem, the structure and function going to be there. Now, next is progressive acidification of oceans, which is causing negative impacts on marine shell forming organisms. <coughs> you know that uh, uh, I have already told, given you some indication what is the problem with the acidification of oceans? Now, the carbon dioxide in the air, when it is increasing, part of that or a major part of that is going to dissolve in the ocean water. Because we know that it is almost 70% of the land surface of the uh, earth surface is actually oceans. So the carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in the ocean and the ocean water will become more acidic. Now, what is the thing? This has got negative impacts on marine shell forming organisms. We will see some picture of this later. Okay. Now, for the time being, we know that the ocean pH, pH or the uh, 
acidity of the ocean is going to increase or the pH is going to come down. Then sea level rise, that is coastal wetlands, mangroves, etc., are going to be negatively impacted. We know that the sea level is rising because the polar ice caps are melting because of the high temperature. So what happens? All the water is going to come into the ocean and the ocean is going to have a level increase, which will affect the coastal wetlands. In Kerala, it is affecting and in mangroves uh, vegetation, in many areas, the mangrove vegetation is disappearing because mangrove vegetation is at the transient uh, area of the uh, land as well as on the sea. So if the water is flooding the, to a higher level, what happens is that many of these uh, mangrove vegetation cannot survive on a totally flooded thing. Because mangroves are a type of vegetation which will need part of the season or part of the day they need the land and the other part they need the salt water of the ocean. So this is the fact and a lot of organisms are living in the mangroves. Many of the fish populations, you know, they are having the spawning in the mangrove vegetation and then they go into the sea. So this is a, a very serious threat to the entire world because the mangrove vegetation is getting disturbed. So, vulnerability of biodiversity and ecosystem due to global change. Now, many in this particular slide, we can see that this is actually a prediction for the, of the, I, I mean, a report of the IPCC in 2014. That is, seven years after the uh, last uh, report was coming out. So this is, you see, uh, how they have changed their wording now. Many terrestrial, freshwater, and marine species have shifted. In the previous one, they said it's going to be affected. But now they say have shifted their geographic ranges, seasonal activities, migration patterns, abundances, and species interactions in response to ongoing climate change, they say it with the high confidence, that is high statistical confidence they are saying. All these have happened which they predicted in 2007. Okay, while only a few recent species extinctions have been attributed as said to climate change. Huh? Only few recent species extinctions have been attributed as it to climate change. Naturally, global climate change at rates slower than current anthropogenic climate change caused significant ecosystem shifts and species extinction during the past millions of years. Now, difficult to, bit difficult to understand this particular sentence which have been taken from the report of IPCC. What they are saying is that the extinction of species have occurred due to the present climate change of the human activity, but it is not as much as the, the natural climate change which happened maybe millions of years ago. Say, I told you while uh, explaining the graph of the climate change that there was a, an ice age many thousands of years ago. And this really destroyed the entire, uh, I mean, entire vegetation as well as the biodiversity in most parts of the world, except the tropics. And many things migrated to the tropical areas at that time. So that is why the, they are saying that the extinction rate is not as much as the one of the many millions of years ago. That is all. Now, vulnerability, vulnerability of biodiversity and ecosystem due to global climate change in the Western lands. Now, we are uh, uh, studying uh, in Kerala and you should be knowing about the Western Guards. Western Guards is the uh, hill ranges extending from the border between Kerala and Tamil Nadu up to the uh, 
state of Gujarat. You know that. Now, what is going to happen to the Western Ghats in response to climate change? We are just having a very quick look at it. Climate change threatens not only the brown mongoose, it is actually taking a very small number of studies take done in Western Ghats, you know, especially with the regard to wildlife. Not only the brown mongoose, but also other endemic species, including endemic, I hope you know, that is uh, more restricted only to the Western Ghats, including the brown palm civet, the male green langur, lion tailed macaque, the male green martin, as well as many species of endemic birds. It is threatening all of them, their extinction probably. Reduction in population and even extinction of species are a real threat in coming decades. So the Western Ghats is really threatened because of the climate change. Climate change is a very real threat to the biodiversity of the Western Ghats. We need effective monitoring of these species of wildlife as there is a depth of data on populations of species like the brown mongoose and the green mongoose. I have specifically taken these words from a paper because this actually uh, throws light on the relevance of your study. You are doing studies on most of the time on the Western Ghats and the surrounding areas it, because you are uh, studying in Wyoming. So uh, it is very important that you study take some examples from around you. This may be anything of wildlife. It can be insects, it can be fishes, it can be mammals, it can be birds, it can be reptiles, or it can be even plants, species. How there is the biodiversity in of any, I mean, we need not look into the general biodiversity. But look into a particular species and make an ecological study. So, if you are going to take up a project in this one, there is ample scope that you make studies on their population abundance and are they going to be threatened? Or what is the microclimate requirement of some of these species? What are the habitat requirements? What are the food habits? And are the food habits going to be threatened by the climate change? There are many such, uh, I mean, aspects you can study when, when, when you are relating your studies to the standards. That is what I am saying. Now, vulnerability of biodiversity and ecosystem due to global climate change in Western Ghats again. Uh, this is a, a you know, this famous uh, ecologist called uh, Professor Mato Gandhi. It is his own words. The effect of climate change is equal on all forest types. But when it comes to Western Ghats, we are already seeing some drastic changes in plant and It is adding to the previous value. You know. We are already seeing a lot of changes in plants and animals behavior in the western Ghats due to climate change. Many high altitude species of fruits and flowers are now blooming in lower regions due to increase in temperature and this has already been recorded in the Himalayas as well. So the advancement of flowering and fruiting in many species because of a higher temperature, especially in the lower part in the lower elevations you can see this one. So this is something of a climate change impact and uh, this is something we can study. The same way, a lot of animals are also going to care of the population is migrating towards higher elevation to keep up, keep away from hot temperatures down below. Then there are uh, many species which are uh, changing their uh, habitat due to heavy rains, landslides, so many things. So you can go to some such locations see that which was affected by landslides or flooding or something like that. And then look at the species and how it is behaving much different from the rest of the uh, Western Ghats. That is also another possibility. 
Yeah, so what are the consequences finally? This is the general consequence, you know, not only to the Western Guards. The planned community composition will be reorganized, new communities will emerge, and others will be lost. Now, this is looking at this particular sentence, it may look very simple, but ecologically speaking, it has got a very serious consequence. What does it exactly say? Planned community composition will be reorganized. What does it mean? What, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Say, for example, one of the predictions for uh, Western gods, uh, according to the climate scientists, is that, due to a climate change, is that we are going to have a, a lot of increase the rainfall after 2030. Not now. I think it is already showing some indications. I feel I am not able to say it very scientifically, but there is a, a trend for increasing rainfall. So, what will happen to the forest in the Western Ghats, Kerala? Say, for example, most of the forest, that is 70 percent of the forest in Kerala, is Moist deciduous forest. You know that. Because moist deciduous forests are those which shed their leaves during the summer and spring up during April, May when the monsoon is started. So most of our forests are moist deciduous forests. Now, what is the speciality with this moist deciduous forest? You know, they are very rich in wildlife. The reason is that they have they expand experience a different type of sunlight. When the leaves are shed, it is bright sun. And then when the leaves are uh, new flushes are come, there is a great good, good darkness in the forest. Now, because of this particular thing, do you find a lot of uh, animal species, bird species, and other things, you know, they are perching on these birds will be a lot of migratory birds within India migrating within India. They come during the summertime and spend the summer and later they come away. So, uh, the similar, similar thing with even animals you can see that. And they migrate to different areas during the, during the summertime and when it, uh, when it is raining they come back. All these things. You know. So, what will happen to a moist deciduous forest if the rainfall is going to increase? We can predict that a moist deciduous forest can become an evergreen forest. The reason is that if you experience more uniform rainfall, more evergreen species of trees will come into this moist deciduous forest. This is uh, nature's uh, way of uh, changing or succession. So if moist deciduous forest will become uh, places for Evergreens, what will happen to many animals? Yeah. Now, animals who are frequenting this moist deciduous forest will get extinct or they will have to migrate to more suitable areas. They may not be able to live in the evergreen forest. So, there will be a lot of changes in the whole ecosystem. So, that is why. The community composition will be reorganized, new communities will come, and emerge, and others will be lost. So this is what they are predicting. So, disruption of food webs and poor evolved mutualisms. But this disruption of food webs, you know, basic ecology. There are food chains and food webs, but that is all interrelated, you know. Where one becomes the prey for another one, and one becomes the food for another one. And once waste is uh, food for it, something else, you know, it, it is actually an interdependence ecosystem. And disruption of food works in an ecosystem. Kill uh, and co evolved mutualisms are there. Mutualisms are there because of this one. Such as the relationship between plant and its pollinator or seed dispenser. All these are going to be disrupted. So it is a complete change in the ecosystem. Now, third one, 
diseases tests and invasive species may spread into new ranges with more pressure pressure on fragile communities so more diseases tests not only to human beings animals also will get more, more and more diseases when the climate is changing because more vectors are coming and uh, some other protective measures may be lost so many of these things are maintaining biodiverse communities will become an even greater conservation priority so our future priority will be very serious that is maintaining biodiversity biodiverse community or protecting the biodiversity will be a serious issue in the future I hope you are getting it. Okay. Now we come into uh, another aspect of this uh, uh, bio I mean, uh, change, that is the climate change. We are looking at uh, carbon sequestration. This is again a very important uh, subject in the modern times, because, uh, which every biologist actually should know. And of course, as wildlife biology students, you should be more having an idea about that. what is carbon sequestration. So what is the word sequestration? I think I have already told you. Sequestration only means in English removal. Removal of carbon. Or if you speak it very specifically, it is removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But who is going to remove this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? We will look at it. So, for a long time, this was a question that was perplexing all the scientists from the 1940s. That is, is forest or agriculture productivity going to increase as CO2 rises in the atmosphere? Or is CO2 a fertilizer? Why is such a question there? You know that. As students of biology, you would have certainly studied that carbon dioxide is the main source for carbohydrates in photosynthesis. What happens in photosynthesis? Let's look at it. Plants can assimilate a great amount of carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis. You know that. Actually, this is uh, me in my very younger days when you know, measuring photosynthesis at the top of the eucalyptus trees, sitting on a staff table with an instrument for uh, photosynthesis uh, in the forest. And uh, this, but, uh, but one, and uh, you know that photosynthesis happens from matter through which the CO2 is diffused. Now, it is also mentioned photosynthesis is usually CO2 limited. So what is that you should understand this uh, clearly then we before we proceed further. Now what is this limitation of CO2? You should know that there are three main factors in photosynthesis. One is the light from the sun and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water in the leaves. Okay, these three things are a must, and the green chlorophyll, of course, which is present in this one. So, what happens is that the CO2 enters through the stomata, and with the help of the light, there is electron transfer within the chloroplast, chlorophyll or the chloroplast, and thereby the chem chemical reactions are performed and the CO2 is actually taken up and converted into sugars for the metabolism of the plant. Now, this is uh, simply the photosynthesis. But if you look into a little bit deeper into uh, the photosynthesis, you will know that this, uh, if you increase the light, will photosynthesis increase? The usual experiments have shown that it does not increase after a certain point because the solar radiation itself is only 1% or less than that is actually required by the plant for the photosynthesis. 
So increasing the light will not increase the photosynthesis. Now, how about water, which is another factor, or chlorophyll, which is another factor, increasing that? Will it increase the photosynthesis? It also will increase only up to a certain level. After that, it will not increase. No photosynthesis is increased. Now, how about CO2? Suppose we increase the concentration of CO2. As I have told you, the usual concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere now, of course, is around 420 or so. Suppose we increase it to 700 or 800. Will there be an increase in photosynthesis? Yes, there will be an increase. The reason is that CO2 is always a limiting factor in photosynthesis. Because if you give more CO2 for the leaves, it is going to photosynthesize more. So the question it is asked like this, is, it, is the CO2 rise in the atmosphere going to increase productivity of agriculture or forestry? That means is CO2 a fertilizer. So that means that this greenhouse effect is going to be a plus point for us. If productivity is going to increase by greenhouse gases, then why not have more greenhouse gases? That means we can burn more fossil fuels and more carbon dioxide is going to be evolved, which will become a fertilizer for the plant. And plants are going to convert everything into Food. Yeah, so we get more food and we, we enjoy life with more of uh, fossil fuels. We drive more cars and we travel on planes and uh, do everything, everything which is carbon rich. So this is the question. Now, uh, what is the answer to this? Let us look at this particular graph. I hope you will be able to understand this graph. I have already constructed this. Uh, that is, uh, you are applying carbon dioxide at uh, 700 ppm watts per million. The, the, the atmospheric concentration is at around 400 ppm. So we are allowing for a normally photosynthesizing plant. 700 ppm as a pulse. Now what happens? Suddenly you can see that the photosynthesis is increasing. Okay? So that means it is true that CO2 is a fertilizer. So this is an instantaneous thing. Now, I was interested in this particular uh, problem and I studied it uh, with, uh, Further, and I found that there is a 40% increase in photosynthesis by this treatment. Now, what happens further? I worked on this uh, particular project in New Zealand, Christchurch in New Zealand, and there they have a number of these chambers where they can grow small trees. These are special chambers. You can see it was a very close up of that. Here you can see that uh, this particular chamber is having an open top. The top is open, it is not completely closed, so that it is exposed to the atmosphere at the top. And from here, we are pumping carbon dioxide at uh, higher concentrations, say 700 ppm. And we are growing plants inside here. And then checking what is happening to it on a long-term basis. The last graph I have showed you was one short pulse, sudden pulse, you know, and then there was an increase. Now, if this increase is going to be sustainable, if this increase is going to continue further, that is what we wanted to check. Now, for that, <laughs> this is the result that we obtained. We studied two plants, beech, that is called in Nautophagus, and another one was pine, pinus. 
aircraft in these two plants we studied, and very surprisingly we found that on long-term exposure, that is several months of exposure to higher CO2 levels. See, this is the graph of the photosynthesis. Actually, this is elevated and this is ambient. Ambient means the one which is uh, the normal one. Okay. The ambient is actually showing more photosynthesis than the elevated when we apply the carbon dioxide on a long term basis. That means there is actually the ambient one, this has the photosynthesis has really come down. Is it not? It's really come down. That means there is a down regulation of photosynthesis by excess of carbon dioxide. So you cannot say that CO2 is always a limiting factor for all the plants, but at least for this particular tree, it is not a limiting factor. Actually, it is a, actually it is a, it is becoming a uh, the, it is to, to go after acclimatizing it. There is a down regulation. What about pine? In this one, you can see that surprisingly, the ambient and the elevated, both the lines are very close together. That is on a long term level, in this particular species of pine, there was no effect. Isn't it very surprising? Now, it is going very much against the graph which I showed you previously, where there was a sudden increase in photosynthesis, but that does not happen on a long term. This is the problem. So, the CO2 becoming a fertilizer is not really very good. Now, how this idea of CO2 becoming a fertilizer, you know, how it has come? You know, it has come from America in the 1940s. And what happened was that, you know, in the in 1940s and uh, even in the very early of the century, you will find that people were growing uh, vegetables in holy houses. Now you know holy houses are there everywhere. So in holy houses they were growing in America, even in the early 19th century. Now what happened was that when you grow poly tomatoes in holy houses, they started producing much bigger fruits and better fruits. So finally they thought that it is uh, something to do with the climate and all. But in the 1940s, somebody got, got the analysis of the air done in this holy house and they found that CO2 is at a very high level in this holy house because it is enclosed space. You know. So they found that it is actually CO2 which is increasing the productivity of the tomato. So this is how the CO2 fertilization idea has come. And later people started thinking that CO2 is a fertilizer for all the plants. But now this graph show that uh, CO2 is not really a fertilizer in all the plants. Maybe in some plants it is true, but not in plants. This is what we have to understand. So what is really happening? I further studied this one. And uh, uh, I'm not going to com complicate you or confuse you with uh, all these uh, cyclones and uh, graphs and all these things, you know, but uh, you, what you should understand. What we found was that the, uh, do, when the CO2 is increasing in these plants, which we have studied, the problem was that the enzyme Rubisco, that is RUBP carboxylase oxygenase, that is the ribulose, phytophosphate, carboxylase, oxygenase. It's a very long term for a enzyme, but it is the most frequent enzyme in nature. Because you find it in all the plants, you know, all the green plants. So it is the most frequent enzyme in nature, you should know it. Now, this rubisco is in the process of photosynthesis, is passing through this particular cycle, and then only it is generating the Three phosphoglycerate, which will be the basic material for glucose production and finally the metabolic part of the synthetic. So this cycle has to be repeated. Now, what is happening 
when we elevate the carbon dioxide is that the starch granules and some other chemical reactions are inhibited or starch granules are produced in the tissue and some other chemicals are inhibited by the CO2 high elevation. So what happens is that this cycle is actually blocked or this rubisco is not regenerated by this particular cycle, thereby the metabolic pathways are not going to be compressed. So that is why the photosynthesis is actually down regulated. I hope you understand. Now, Rubisco can convert only 3 to 10 molecules of free CO2 per second. So, but when you are increasing the photosynthesis, this Rubisco cannot handle that much of CO2 for photosynthesis. This is another problem. The drawback with that enzyme, it cannot work in the dark. That is another problem with this enzyme. Leaf nitrogen concentration is important for its activity. So, the nitrogen is not away nitrogen is normally only available for any plant. It cannot have more nitrogen because CO2 is more. No, it is not there. So that is there. But RUBP regeneration is important for the cycle to regenerate. So uh, to run. So RUBP is not uh, produced. Well, sink strength is an important factor. What is sink strength? When a plant is only growing, it is producing fruits or producing leaves or producing roots. With the sink strength is there. So the sink strength is also not coping up with the increasing CO2 because of the starch accumulation problems are there. So all these things, you know, that, uh, that are creating problem. So there could be a down regulation. It is not always an up regulation, as we said. So this photosynthesis, the final question that I would like to answer now is, is it going to CO2 going to rise? I mean, the rise in the atmosphere will help to increase the photosynthesis? My answer is three answers. In some plants it will increase. In some plants it is acclimation as you have seen in pine. And in some plants it is down regulation as you have seen in these. I hope you understand this now. No? The increase in CO2 need not really help in productivity increase in forestry or in agriculture or anything like that due to photosynthesis. Now, there is a, another important question that uh, we should like to, uh, we would like to see that. That is, there is a physiological saturation. It is, photosynthesis increases as a declining exponential with the CO2. It is actually the photosynthesis is as the CO2 will be x axis is increasing CO2. You can see as the uh, concentration of CO2 is increasing, it is actually plateauing at a certain level, not really increasing, not otherwise the graph should have been shooting up like this as I am like this arrow is moving, you know, not uh, plateauing here, you know. And uh, uh, so, the, the, so there is no, no such thing as a, the, the, we have more CO2 in the atmosphere, we have more productivity. No, it is not, not correct. It is not going to help us that way. Then respiration increases res exponentially with the temperature. You know both in plants and animals. One specific thing that you should know, that is uh, the rate of respiration increases with the temperature. Yeah, the Q10, you would have say, heard about it, you know, that is increasing the temperature by 10 degrees. What is the respiration rate? That is the Q10. So it is going to, uh, respiration increase will exponentially, increases exponentially with the temperature. And what is respiration? You know that it is not a, it is a catabolic process. That is, it is a destructive process where energy is actually consumed. Understand? So that way, it will only bring down the productivity. It is not, if the photosynthesis is only into increasing the productivity, that means that along with that, the temperature is also increasing. In the atmosphere, you know, as an impact of climate change, 
So respiration is also increasing. So finally, where are we going to stand? We will stand at the same productivity or less productivity because the temperature is going to increase. Yeah? Finally, the productivity of our forestry or agriculture is going to come back. Now, this is very important in the sense that uh, uh, now, now, for example, we are looking at a problem, especially in Kerala, that is uh, the uh, man animal conflict. You understand that? Uh, we are at, at a, farmers are complaining at many places, in, not only in Kerala, all over Western parts, all over the <laughs> place where the uh, agriculture is near the forest. Now, what are they complaining? They are saying, saying that all their crops are being destroyed by so many animals like uh, the wild boar, the hens, the monkeys, several types of birds, and so many other uh, animals. But what is the reason for it? The main reason is that many of these animals are trying to find their food easily in the farmer's place rather than in the forest. Because the forest, the food is getting reduced. They don't have the food, the right kind of food they want. Say, for example, why the elephants are coming down? You should know that the main food for the elephants, one is bamboo, and the young shoots of them. Second is gas. If these two things are not there, elephants are going to come out. Because they don't eat many other things in the forest. Don't think that they are going to uh, take away all these uh, uh, leaves of uh, different trees and all that. No, no they don't eat those things. They like to eat only palm leaves. So they come to attack the coconut trees. Otherwise, they should get bamboo. But young bamboo shoots they prefer. So they, it is not always available, you know. So, and uh, grass. Grass should be also available, but uh, any, if the forest is fully covered, hardly any grass will grow underneath. There are not shade tolerant grasses growing in the forest, many of them. So these are all problems. You know, and, uh, so you will find that the productivity of the forest is going to come down due to climate change. Then the, the movement patterns of many of these animals will also change and we will have more problems in future. But, to anticipate. Now, this, I mean, I have now, I have so far described some of my experience, which I have in New Zealand and some other places also. Now, this is, a, this is, a, I'm not involved in this, but uh, this is free air carbon dioxide enrichment, or simply called the phase experiment site in the USA, to study the changes in trees due to elevated CO2. Now, what they are doing is that, they are erecting some tubes in the form of a ring. Several such rings are there. This is not a garden, you know. You should not think that it is a garden. It's actually a very dense forest. And these are trees flowering here, you see, of some species. And there are other two non-flowering species are there. Could be a plantation of eucalypt, maybe. I'm not sure. Or uh, pines. And uh, they are actually pumping high concentration of CO2 into the atmosphere of this forest. I was doing it in a chamber, whereas these fellows are trying to do the uh, experiment in the open itself. And then see what is the response. Let us look at what is the response. This is actually a magnification of that one of the phase second. Yeah? These are the tubes, which will be all the time, all the 24 hours, seven days a week, you know, it will be pumping a high amount of CO2 to the surrounding trees. And then they are, a, this particular person is looking at uh, many physiological and ecological features of uh, these trees which are growing there. Long-term phase studies have not detected any major photosynthetic acclimation at least in some of the species. So the acclimation which I noticed is restricted only to some species. Yeah? Acclimation was there in where? In pines it was there. So that was there. And sound regulation similarly. 
which is restricted only to a few species and not to all species. So, what is our current information regarding crop productivity? Let us see the crop productivity also at elevated CO2. Small beneficial effects on crop yields in temperate regions corresponding to local mean temperature increase of 1 to 3 degrees Celsius and associated CO2 increase and rainfall changes. So, what is the, I mean, you should see that this is actually prediction for temperate regions here in the tropics. Right? Not for us, it is in for Europe and America. Increase of 1 to 3 degrees Celsius will increase the productivity to some extent. I hope you understand. They are going to get some increase in productivity due to this climate because the increase in temperature, because they have got very hard winter. So if they get a higher temperature during the winter, they can grow many more crops and the crops will be more productive. In tropical regions, models indicate negative yield impacts for the major cereals even with the moderate temperature, temperature increase of 1 to 2 degrees Celsius. So, for the tropics, for us, what is the thing? Major negative impacts on yield for cereals, for our rice crop, for example. What will happen to the rice? In a study done in Kerala, they have shown that even an increase of 1 degree Celsius right, will inhibit pollination of rice. So, productivity of rice can be. So, for the warming projected for the end of 21st century has increasingly negative impacts on the So, we are going to enjoy these food impacts only for some time later, that is later part of the 21st century, that is after the 2050, you are going to have negative impacts everywhere. So what is our current information on forestry productivity? This is more important for us than agriculture productivity. Net primary production, that is usually referred that is a primary production. At 560 ppm CO2 has been shown to increase by 23.2 percent. So it is said that uh, during this century, there will be part of the, I mean, by, by 2050, there will be an increase in productivity by 23.2 percent in forestry. Resulted mainly because of increasing leaf area, hence more light absorption and also increase the light use efficiency. So, the plants are going to have a more leaves because of uh, the more increased the light and then light absorption and light use efficiency. So, the productivity increase does not match with the photosynthesis increase because of reduced leaf area or display per unit biomass. There is 21 percent increase in the light and 9 percent increase in the so, actually it is not water synthesis which is increasing. Yeah? It is actually the leaf area is increasing. So, from the leaf area, the present leaf area will be at a higher leaf area. Then naturally the productivity will increase due to because more area is available for water synthesis. It is not, you only see that it is not the rate of water synthesis increase that is going to increase for it is only the leaf area in this which is going to increase production. Now, what do we know about the response of tropical trees and the elevated CO2 levels? Hardly any long term exposure studies have been done in tropical trees. This is something of a very bad thing which uh, we all experience. That is, in the tropical area, we have very few scientific studies on climate change. Actually, there should have been more studies on climate change in tropical area because the biodiversity is more in tropics. But unfortunately, because of the lack of funds and lack of personnel, all these things, we have less number of studies. It is for you people to study this. Understand? You have a lot of problems often before you 
which take up in products or in research and then try to solve any of the problems. Okay, now a brief uh, thing about uh, climate change and water use. We started uh, at uh, 4.10, so I will go up to, uh, sorry, 3.10, 3, so I will go up to, uh, okay, so I have another 10 minutes now. Climate change and water use, that is again uh, another important aspect of it. Now, this is again uh, some of the studies which I have done uh, in uh, in our moist deciduous forest in Nilambu, which is uh, this place, it's called the Patakarim in Nilambu. And very, what you can simply see that we need not worry too much about it. Uh, what is important is that uh, uh, in uh, these these graphs are actually indicating the water use of four these species: Raitia, Melaina, Stereospermum, Zydea. Now, so, for example, this pink one, you can see that it is Melaina arborea. It is a very common species of our moist deciduous forest. Right? It gives a timber which is not, of course, very valuable. But okay. Now, in this particular graph, you can see that that everything you should look at along with this particular graph. This is actually showing the VPD, that is vapor pressure deficit. Right? Vapor pressure deficit is nothing but a, 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 a the hybrid between temperature and humidity. Yeah? So, as vapor pressure deficit, deficit means that the amount of, uh, uh, of the humidity that is remaining in the atmosphere, VPD is the deficit. So, it is less amount of humidity in the atmosphere when this graph goes up. When the less amount of the, I mean, humidity is there in the atmosphere, what happens is that many of these trees close their stem. Otherwise, they are losing more water through transpiration. Although some species don't have much response, but most of the other species, they have response. For example, this blue, stereosperm, uh, the blue one. Here you can see that that is actually increasing the water use, whereas Melina is decreasing drastically the water use. There are some other species like uh, Xylia, it hasn't got much response, although it is only showing slight increase. Right? So uh, there are all such things. So VPD, I told you, is a hybrid between, I will explain it further uh, in another class. That is, when higher temperature is there, we will usually will have a higher VPD or less humidity in the atmosphere. So naturally, the there are many trees which will increase their transpiration and many trees which will decrease their transpiration. Both are not good. They should go normally. When a plant is increasing its transpiration means that it is losing water from the soil. So it will be very prone to drought. It may dry up due to a drought. And one which is controlling very drastically means that what will happen to it? The water in the leaves will boil inside. The latent heat of the water will increase in the leaf and the leaf will start scorching or drying. You have seen that if you do not water the plants in your garden, leaves are scorching. What is really happening? It may not be losing water, but very soon you will find that the leaves are scorched. It's because the latent heat is increasing inside and the grass is the matter is all closing. They are not open and so no cooling. <coughs> now, uh, this is another work which I have done in the Pichi Guarani Wildlife Sanctuary. That is water use of from the whole sanctuary, the wildlife sanctuary. How it is, I mean, it is again a very important thing. 
because the availability of water is very important for the wildlife also, and for the plants, everything. Huh? And uh, you will find that uh, this is actually used to using the computer models. And here, what we could uh, derive is that uh, the sorry. You see that uh, uh, leaf area index is actually showing in this particular graph, and 24-hour evapotranspiration is being shown in this one. Now, this is the reservoir, which is associated with the PG dam, this area, where the maximum evaporate transpiration is there. Whereas, in many other areas, with, re with related to different crops and trees and other plantations, this is varying. You can see that it is uh, coming less and less with upper transpiration. So, depending upon the type of vegetation, there is a lot of uh, variation. This is, it. So this is about the water use. Now, water use is therefore very important to know, especially in regard to climate change, because water is a very important thing for the Now, next is uh, phenology. And uh, phenology is again another very important thing that is related to climate change. Phenology, as you know, is the life cycle change so, that is happening. Now, let us look at spring flowering in a large number of Mediterranean plant species is advancing by a few days. Now, flowering in many species, this is Mediterranean, but in tropics also it is happening. We are not studied at all. That is all. Right? What is happening is that the Flowering is actually advancing by several days or weeks. That is advancing. Say a plant, say for example, we have got a, a canicona. And you know that it is a very important species religiously. And uh, it usually flowers during the Vishu. Now, many years, for the, you know, for the last so many years, now we are seeing that it is happening, it should happen somewhere in March. But Anikana is flowering already in February. And by March, there is no flower for the religious purposes. So this is happening. Yeah? So this is actually an impact of climate change on phenology. Yeah? The flowering is getting advanced, which is called advanced, advancing the flower. That is, before the date itself, it is growing. So this is happening, and many studies are being done on this. Now, this is another one. I mean, again, phenology. This is the duration of stay of birth. Don't think that phenology is for plants only. I mean, it's also very phenology. Right? Duration of stay of bird species in the Mediterranean region. Now, these black triangles are there in the graph, and white triangles are there. Black triangle for Apis Apis, and the, black, the white triangle for Hirunga Rustica. Now, you see that the number of, uh, see, in 1940s, they used to stay around 230 days in a particular area, in a particular island, whatever where they are frequenting. But uh, by 1980s, you see, they have uh, they, this 230 has come down to 140. Whereas for this one, this 230 almost has come down to 190. So, they are staying for less number of days in that particular habitat. They are migrating further. So, the migration pattern has completely changed in some of the species. So, for an insect, let the mustarsa, the Mediterranean region, we call it uh, the ladybird you know, in English. There are all five types of ladybirds. And here again, if you see the first appearance of this insect. In 1950, the first appearance used to happen 140 day, 140th day of the year. Julian day actually means January 1st is Julian day 1 and December 31st is Julian day 365. So 140 will be around, if you divide it by approximately 30, uh, around April, May, eh? it used to appear and then by 1990 or 2000, you can see that uh, it uh, appeared some 20, 30 days earlier. 
So there is a, people are studying such things, you know. And if, uh, for a long term study, it is very good. But for genealogical study, you have to make long term study, then it becomes very easy. Okay, thank you. I think uh, with this, we close this biodiversity and climate change, and uh, next class we will take up another uh, topic. Now, uh, you can ask some quick questions if it's possible, if you have one, uh, and uh, would like to ask. Was it very clear? Somebody can unmute and tell you. Okay. No response. Uh, sir, I have a doubt. Sir, yeah, tell me. Uh, so you mentioned about carbon sequestration. So, uh, does artificially planting trees through scientific methods like uh, Miyawaki or uh, something like that does that have any effect on uh, the carbon sequestration by the trees? So artificial planting of trees. Yes, sir. In That's mass right. numbers. In as a plantation, raising plantations. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I will come to come into that when we do it with the mitigation. Uh, what is the advantage of planting trees and uh, what are the impacts of? Uh, certainly, we, we we need more coverage of uh, of the earth by trees that will have uh, certainly a very big impact on uh, uh, the carbon sequestration. Yeah, that is one mitigation method suggested by. And that is the, that is one of the reasons why on uh, every environment day a lot of people are planting trees. This is one of the reasons, one of the main reasons. Yes, sir. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, if there is no further questions, I understand. I take it for granted that you have understood everything. Okay, I will give you some more notes in the meantime, and tomorrow we meet the same time at three o'clock. Okay. Yes, sir. Bye thank for you, sir. and thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.